Okay, well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am so glad you're with us on the program today. Uh, My friend Jim Garrity from National Review is going to be joining us here in just a moment. We're going to be talking about the uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, by uh, the Russian military and how this relates to the idea of armed self-defense from a personal perspective. Uh, I, I know that there are uh, all kinds of folks who say, oh, no, 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 it's apples to, to elephants when you talk about, uh, you know, the, the ability of a, of a nation like Ukraine to be able to defend itself against foreign invaders uh, and the right of the people to protect themselves against, I don't know, home intruders, for instance. Uh, but... I think that argument, frankly, uh, the fact oh, oh, it's apples and elephants, I don't think it actually holds up. I think that there really are some valid comparisons between these uh, two situations. When we're talking about national security versus personal defense, let's pick up the conversation again with uh, Jim Garrity from National Review. Take a look and a listen. Jim, thank you so much, sir, for coming on the program. It's good talking with you today. Cam, it is always good to see your face and hear your voice and I wish the news were better. I mean, I wish, you know, it'd be great if we could talk about some good stuff. But and there is some good stuff going on. But of course, the uh, uh, the big news, uh, grim and, uh, you know, it's 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 not looking good out there right now. Jim Garrity, Uh, we are now two weeks into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, We've always been talking about it at Bering Arms from a you know, right to keep and bear arms perspective, the the number of Ukrainian citizens who have picked up guns for the very first time in their lives over the past two weeks, the relaxing of the gun laws in Ukraine uh, so that folks can actually carry guns in self-defense. We're now seeing this sort of spread out to uh, other nations as well. I, I wrote uh, this morning about the Estonian Gun Owners Association, which is asking the Estonian government to let Estonian gun owners start keeping more rounds of ammunition at home because uh, they are limited in Estonia to the number of rounds of ammunition they can have. Uh, The Estonian Gunners Association also wants to ban all Russian nationals living in the country from legally possessing firearms. So we're actually seeing some gun owners uh, call for gun control laws in the name of national security. Uh, And, and, you know, as I was reading your piece at the Jolt, uh, I think this was yesterday, when you're talking about, you know, the Russian hawks were right. Uh, It really struck me that whether we're talking about personal security or national security, the idea of armed deterrence uh, being either a positive good or uh, conversely, actually being a a, an antagonistic feature. Right. Uh, Well, you owning a gun or you having the means to defend yourself, that just makes uh, uh, your enemies more likely to attack you. It seems like this is now a a part of the debate and and, uh, the discussion about what's taking place in Ukraine right now. I was going to say, my, my first thought, Cam, was like, isn't it a delightful change of pace to watch Democratic officials and big mainstream media voices watching the arming of citizens in Ukraine and saying, boy, that's good for them. Those guys really should do that. That's, that is smart and wise and probably necessary. So good for them. Of course, we'd never need that there in this country. I think. And, and yes, you know, the odds of a Russian invasion of the United States are extraordinarily unlikely despite what we were learned from Patrick Swayze and Charlie Sheen and everyone from Red Dawn back in the 1980s. Um, I'm not even going to bring up the crazy remake where North Korea chose to no. invade the... Yeah, you know. That doesn't exist. That's yeah. that now. No. It's like that fourth Indiana Jones movie and Godfather <laughs> 3. It's been erased from the timeline. Exactly. Um, yeah, it was just... I was just, Yesterday's piece was just basically, you know, it was, it was focused on foreign policy, but it was kind of like, this, this is why those of us who think of ourselves as hawks see the world the way we do. And yeah, there was a little bit of, you know, neener, 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 we were right, you were wrong. But there, I, my colleague, Jay Nordlinger, had this, hang on one second, it's it's the FSB, they've decided to call. <laughs> um, Jay Nordlinger made the point that if, he you know, retweeted and he said, like, if, if I controlled the world, we wouldn't need armies. We wouldn't need police. We wouldn't need, no, no one would have to lock their doors because there'd be no thieves, there'd be no... Uh, burglars, rapists, you know, maniacs, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we live in a world with these things. And thus we have to adjust what we do that it doesn't do us any good to wish the world did not have a Russian army that is willing to invade Ukraine. It doesn't do us any good to pretend terrorists don't exist. It doesn't do us any good to pretend 
rogue, you know, rogue states, uh, transnational crime, cartels, all that. Look, look, the world is full of dangers. And if you're a hawk, you've always recognized it. And my guess is there's kind of a, a domestic equivalent of a hawk, which is a we live in a dangerous world. Hopefully, you never hear the breaking of glass in your house in the middle of the night waking you up. Hopefully, you never hear somebody trying to get it, come home and somebody's in your house. Hopefully, you never uh, are going into your back to your car in a parking garage late at night and you hear footsteps behind you and you think there's a bad intent of someone. Like, hopefully, none of those. And it's possible you go through life and that never happens. And if it does, if you go through life and you never encounter that, great, God bless you, fantastic. But then you could live in a world where that could happen. And consider, particularly when you consider crime rates lately, um, it would seem foolish to count on luck getting you through something like that. Now, some folks are just not going to be comfortable with a firearm. Maybe they prefer an alarm system. Maybe they prefer a dog. You know, whatever show you go. But the idea of just going through life and just hoping things turn out okay um, doesn't seem like a particularly good plan. And I think that, you know, I don't know whether people necessarily, either you go through life and you've, you've had that happen, um, or you've had something where you just have seen it's happened to somebody you love. You, you have something where you recognize it's a dangerous world. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? You can talk, call 911. The cops might get there in time, but they might not. If you, you know, um, your your other, you know, tools of defense, you know, the alarm might scare them off. It might not. If it's, if it's a typical burglar, yeah, they'll probably run away. If it's a maniacal axe murderer, then maybe not. Maybe they're not going to be deterred by that sort of thing. Um, so it's, you're, you're in a situation of what do you want to do? If you have a firearm, you have that option for your home defense. Now, some people may not be comfortable with that or may not want to do that, and that's fine. But it's just, that gives you an option. You have that. You know, may create other you know, potential risks. I don't think any responsible gun owner would pretend that those risks don't exist. But at least you have that option, and it gives you one more possibility to avoid the most dire of outcomes. I think it's just it's, it's a philosophy of life, and I think a lot of people are comfortable just hoping things turn out okay. I think a lot of us would prefer to have some, some mechanism in which we can you know affect the outcome for a better outcome for ourselves. Absolutely. And, and, and listen, I mean, you're, you're right about uh, watching many folks on the left now take this tone where, oh, great, I'm glad to see the Ukrainians are fighting back and at the same time uh, trying to pass more gun control laws here. And I, I listen, I'm not naive uh, enough to believe that uh, that contradiction is going to be resolved in favor of Democrats saying, oh, you know what? I, I, now I see the light when it comes to the right to keep your arms. I, I wish... But I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but at the same time, you know, again, this idea that we see from the left uh, that, uh, well, you know what, if 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 you didn't own a gun, uh, then you'd be better off. Right. Because, A, you'd be less likely to hurt yourself. But uh, really, you know, you don't need a gun anyway. Uh, you know, nobody wants to hurt you. Just cooperate and, and you know, <laughs> hand over your stuff and they'll leave you alone. Um, again, I mean, I, I see some parallels here to. What's going on in Ukraine, right? Roll over, acquiesce, let Putin get what he wants, and then he'll go away and uh, he won't bomb your cities and he won't kill your children and you know, everything will be fine and dandy. And look, if some folks want to, 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 to choose to take that route, if they are the victim of a violent crime, it may vary. In some situations, it might even be the smart thing to do. Yeah. But to deny everyone or to deprive everyone of the uh, the right to fight back and the ability to fight back. And I would argue, Jim, that you're right. Owning a gun is no guarantee that you will successfully be able to protect your life against a home invader or a carjacker. But you hit on something really important, that it gives you the ability to at least try. It gives you a chance. You know, I, I again, I'm not naive enough to believe that uh, Ukraine is going to uh, be able to stop uh, all of the Russian advances, push Russia out of uh, Ukrainian territory and, you know, take the fight to Moscow. It may very well be that the the next phase uh, in this war is a guerrilla warfare, uh, you know, where you've got uh, Russian occupiers who are now being shot at by uh, Ukrainian civilians. Uh, it may very well be that some of the civilians who picked up guns for the first time in their lives over the past couple of weeks do not survive this attack. And again, I think it gets to a fundamental question of should you have the right to fight back or should you be required to bend a knee and acquiesce? And I 
I, I, I can't gra- I can't even wrap my head around an ideology that says, no, you should not be allowed to fight back. You should you should not be allowed to die on your feet. You must live on your knees. Yeah. And anything where you're counting on the reasonableness of someone who has chosen to attack you is, is an unsafe is, is a bad bet. It's, it's something you're not likely to lose. And I was thinking about, you know, parallels in terms of foreign policy, domestic policy. Most of us who consider ourselves hawks would say, we, obviously, we, we, we believe what we believe because we hate war, because we don't want war, right? If you, if you want peace, prepare for war, right? And it all builds up this concept of deterrence. The, I know, one of the metaphors I used in that piece was that you very rarely see burglars or you very rarely see thieves attempting to rob the donut shop that's across the street from the police station, right? Very few people want the biggest, baddest, most painful fight that they could possibly get, right? People, people go to pleasure and they go away from pain. That's kind of the basic, you know, human programming here. So one of the reasons why the U.S., you know, uh, Teddy Roosevelt speaks softly and carry a big stick, one of the reasons that the U.S. has tried to have a, you know, fairly strong military is this idea of, well, one, no one will directly attack us. And secondly, uh, you know, secondly, we can help defend our allies if they become under attack. And then thirdly, the presence of a U.S. carrier group in a, you know, particular off the shore of a particular area can calm things down. It can make people say, all right, you, you know, do you want us to come over there? Do you want us to intervene? This, this recognition that we have overwhelming force and we can do this. Obviously, when you're dealing with Russia and Ukraine and a foe that has, has nuclear weapons, it's a very different dynamic. And I think a lot of Americans are kind of thrown by the fact that, like, we can't go out and bomb, you know, like, well, you know, you're being calling for a no-fly zone. And I totally understand why people feel this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, a sense of feeling powerless and helpless and wanting to do more for the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainian, you know, Zelensky is specifically asking for it. The problem is, and I tried to lay this out because there was a, a group of 37 defense experts who said that we have a partial no-fly zone, Cam, which is, you know, the, I guess you call that a some-fly zone. Um, which is, which basically is like trying to be a little bit pregnant. You basically, you either have the ability to shoot somebody down because they're in the airspace, they're not supposed to, or you don't. There is no maybe sort of kind of, we shoot near the Russian jets, but we don't hit, you know, know, a no-fly zone means Russia and NATO go to war. Now, maybe some people think that's worthwhile. I think most of us are afraid that even if that kind of conflict started conventional, the possibility of it escalating to a nuclear exchange really is terrifying. You and I are of the age we've seen the day after. We've seen all these nuclear Holocaust movies. And we, we know that like this is not, a, you know, the possibility of a nuclear war, which hopefully most days is at zero. I think it's now at about 1%. It's not likely, but it's not unthinkable that various dominoes start to fall. Russian troops get lost and go across a border. Um, Ukraine does something that provokes a bigger response. Uh, this whole controversy yesterday about whether Poland was going to turn over its MiG 29s to the Ukrainians. And at the last, so it seems like at the last second, the, the Pentagon, John Kirby, spokesman John Kirby said, We just don't think this is going to work, which is kind of, kind of you know, one, the agreement between the Polish and the Ukrainians came as a surprise, apparently to the Pentagon, which is very surprising. And then the second thing is the Pentagon coming in and saying, Yeah, we just don't think this is going to work. When Ukraine said we want them, and Poland said, sure, we'll give them to you as long as the U.S. gives us F-15s or some sort of better American jet to replace it. Um, I can't help but wonder if there is some sort of back-channel communication from the Russians of if those jets take off from a NATO base to come to Ukraine, even if they're now technically Ukrainian jets, even if they have Ukrainian pilots in them, we will consider that to be a NATO attack on Russia. And that, you know, opens Pandora's box. I don't know that that happened, but that does, that would be the sort of thing that would explain the Pentagon suddenly coming out and saying, whoa, 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 we're not doing this deal. We don't like this deal. And as a result, the biggest trade of the day was not over the F- the, the big 29 jets, but about Russell Wilson going to the Denver Broncos. Um, so yes, it, it, it's the, the idea of deterrence. You know, I, nobody's going to raid our friend Charlie Cook's house, I, I, or at least I got help them if they do. You know, if you know somebody's got a huge gun collection, could you try to rob them? I mean, you could, you could try, but the odds of that going very, very badly for you are much higher. Weapons can be a deterrent. Weapons can also be, be destabilizing. I'm not going to you know, lie, but uh, all in all, that um, this is a, you know, there's kind of a whole philosophy of life of how do you do, what do you do when, you, when you're confronted with the presence of evil? And I guess there are also some people who just don't want to believe in the concept of evil. Everybody's just misguided or misunderstood or something like that. And it's kind of a, 
They need a hug. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like if I was Putin's mom, I would just again. love him so much. Just love yeah. him so hard. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. We, we can't hug it out with Vladimir Putin. Sorry, not going to work. Uh, no, we cannot. Uh, and uh, I, again, I don't think that means that, uh, you know, we can uh, afford to uh, start a fight as NATO or, or as the United States. Um, but I am, you know, again, uh, you know, you, you look at, at the uh, the threats from Putin. And again, I, I like you, I, I'm not convinced that uh, at some point Putin just doesn't decide to attack NATO anyway. Um, but I say, again, I think what we're seeing here is. Uh, OK, give give the Russians, give Putin no excuse, no reason or justification to do so. And then to try to say it was our fault. Uh, let it be just as clear as the atrocities that we're seeing being committed against civilians in Ukraine right now, uh, that this is all on Putin. If, in fact, uh, that next step happens. And I hope and pray that it doesn't. Uh, anyway, Jim, listen, I, I you know, this is one of those topics where you and I could obviously talk for hours and hours and hours. I, I appreciate you joining us on the program. Hope we get a chance to connect again uh, in, in the near future. And uh, until we speak again, Wolverines. And Jennifer Gregg. Never, never forget her. <laughs> the glue that kept everyone together. Um, yeah, Cam, you know, you at some point in the future, you will hear me talk about this for hours and hours, whether you want to or not. Excellent. Jim Garrity from National Review joining us here on Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I do appreciate uh, Jim joining us on the program. Now let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, our recidivist report. We'll start there with a, a story out of Indianapolis, Indiana, where the uh, local president of the Fraternal Order of Police uh, says he wants to know what the heck happened to allow a suspect accused of shooting a uh, police officer in the city to bond out on f- after $500. That's it. That's amazing. Rick Snyder uh, wants to know why 31-year-old Malik Hill was able to bond out when he was on probation for a previous violent crime. Uh, There were charges that were announced on Tuesday by the Marion County Prosecutor's Office uh, against uh, Hill for the shooting again of a uh, police officer in Fountain Square late last month. But Snyder asked, Uh, During this press conference, why didn't you move to revoke the bond when you filed charges? Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Officer Thomas Mangan was seriously injured in the shooting back on February 27th. According to a probable cause affidavit, Hill was charged on January 31st with uh, stealing electronics from a Walmart, fleeing from police in a vehicle. He was arrested and apprehended by police later that day. He was charged with theft and resisting law enforcement. At that point, though, he was already on probation for a prior robbery, and he was on probation for felony firearm possession. Despite that, Hill was able to bond out on just $500. Snyder says we have this basic question. By releasing this suspect on a low $500 cash bond, knowing that he was on parole on conditional release and the prior criminal history, how did that serve the safety of the public? Now, again, he asked this question to Ryan Mears. The prosecutor there in Marion County, who, according to WRTV, did not specifically answer Snyder, but instead said that sometimes these situations are a matter of timing. He said, quote, by the time we filed the case, that particular individual was released. And the only thing that we could do at that particular point of time is to request a warrant. And there was a parole warrant active at the time this incident occurred. The uh, police chief in uh, Indianapolis, by the way, Randall Taylor, says uh, at least now the suspect is off the streets. And, you know, here's the thing. We wrote about, uh, I wrote a, uh, a, a story yesterday for Bearing Arms uh, about another case where you've got somebody who is charged with murder who is out on bond and now charged with murder again. Now his bond has been revoked. I understand that not every case, you're, you're not going to be able to keep, nor should you be allowed to keep every criminal suspect behind bars until they await trial. That's That would violate They're right. We are innocent until proven guilty in a court. At least we are considered by the justice system to be innocent until proven guilty. They're mitigating factors when it comes to keeping individuals behind bars. Are they a flight risk? Are they a threat to the community at large? If we release this person while they are awaiting trial, are they going to show up in court? How many people might they hurt in the meantime? Those are legitimate questions that can be asked. Uh, in the case of uh, Malik Hill, you could argue, well, look, he was picked up on a nonviolent offense. He was picked up on basically a theft charge. So why would they hold him? 
Well, I would argue the reason why they would hold him is because he violated the terms of his probation. And once you violated the terms of your probation, that should come with some consequences beyond a warrant being issued at some point in the future. Because it's not like an all-points bulletin gets put out and, and every officer in the streets of Indianapolis are now looking for Malik Hill because a warrant's been issued for his arrest. If they run across him, they can take him into custody. But it's not like the uh, police department was now looking for this guy, specifically, you know, combing the streets to find him because a warrant was out for his arrest. That's not how that works. So I got to say, I, I, am, I, I feel the frustration of the FOP president there in Indianapolis. Again, I, I, I don't think that we can, nor should we, try to keep every criminal defendant uh, in jail until they go to trial. But we clearly, and it's not just in one jurisdiction, we clearly have cases right now where dangerous and violent offenders who are, again, either already on probation for violent crimes or they have been previously accused and are awaiting trial for violent crimes are now being arrested, charged with violent crimes again, and swiftly being returned to the streets. That is an issue. That is a problem. By the way, it's a problem that's not going to be addressed by additional gun control laws, but it is, I believe, another reason why every American should take their right to keep and bear arms for self-defense seriously. All right, today's uh, Armed Citizen story, speaking of that, from uh, Lithonia, Georgia, where an 18-year-old was killed in what police are describing was a, a self-defense shooting that also left a 25-year-old man in critical condition on Monday night. This was around 6.30 Monday. Uh, police were called out to the scene of a shooting. They found a man with uh, at least one gunshot wound. He was taken to a local hospital uh, in critical condition. A short time later, officers found a second man, who they say had been shot multiple times, uh, deceased on the scene. Police later said that the two victims got into an argument which led to the 18-year-old firing first. A third man fatally shot that 18-year-old. Police said the third man will not face any charges because he shot in self-defense. Police did not say the 25-year-old would face any charges. They have not released the identities of any of the three. Uh, but again, they do say that uh, that third party who shot and killed the 18-year-old was acting in self-defense. Sounds like uh, perhaps defense of another as well. Uh, we'll keep our eyes on this uh, story, bring you any more details uh, when they become available. I think we probably should learn some additional information in the not-too-distant future. Finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, an officer in Rogersville, Alabama, who ran into a burning apartment to rescue a three-year-old from the fire that was raging inside. Officer Tyler Dyson. Uh, wasn't even uh, on the scene, but he knew that he could get there before firefighters arrived when the call came out about this uh, this blaze. Firefighters were about seven minutes away. Dyson said he knew he could make it there in about three minutes. So early on the morning of March 6th, Dyson, 24 years of age, who's just wrapping up an overnight shift, he said, I got to I got to save this child at all costs. He got there again before the firefighters arrived. There were flames shooting out of the windows, smoke billowing out of the building, according to WAAY. He was able to force his way inside where he found and rescued that three-year-old boy. The Rogersville Volunteer Fire Department said Officer Dyson placed the child in his police car, traveled to meet the incoming ambulance. Officer Dyson sustained burns to his arm and actually melted his uniform from the heat. The three-year-old taken to a local hospital. Uh, for treatment, then later flown to the University of Alabama, Birmingham for medical care. Uh, he um, is, however, expected to make a full recovery. When firefighters arrived on the scene, they were able to help another resident out of the apartment. Uh, and according to police, this fire was intentionally set. A 44-year-old man charged with seven counts of first-degree arson. And he told authorities that he set the fire and left his son inside. It is unknown whether or not, it's unclear from from reports, I should say, whether or not that child who was left inside is the three-year-old that Officer Dyson managed to rescue from the flames. But community members have been praising Dyson for his action. Uh, one uh, leaving a comment on the uh, Rogersville Fire Department Facebook page saying, I'm praying for the child and Officer Dyson. Y'all do an amazing job, and we are blessed to have such a dedicated group. Well, again, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing to save the life of that child. Rogersville, Alabama, Police Officer Tyler Dyson, we thank you for your very good deed. Now, that is going to do it for this edition of Barry and Arms Cam & Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program. As always, 
Don't forget to uh, check out Bearing Arms, the website, bearingarms.com, throughout the day for even more Second Amendment news and information that you need to know about. If you like what you see, you can always become a VIP subscriber. Just go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. You can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. And because we really do appreciate your support, in exchange, we're going to give you exclusive content, analysis, news stories, columns you just won't find anywhere else because your support really does matter. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. But until then, be well, be safe, and be free.